As a longtime foreign correspondent, I've worked in lots of places, but nowhere as important to the world as China. I'm Jane Perlez, former Beijing bureau chief for The New York Times. Join me on my new podcast, Face Off, U.S. versus China, where I'll take you behind the scenes in the tumultuous U.S.-China relationship. Find Face Off wherever you get your podcasts. China has emerged as one of the 21st century's most consequential nations, making it more important than ever to understand how the country is governed. Welcome to Pekingology, the podcast that unpacks China's evolving political system. I'm Jude Blanchett, the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS, and this week I'm joined by Andrew Walder, the Denise O'Leary and Kent Theory Professor at Stanford University. Today we'll be discussing his article, China's Extreme Inequality, The Structural Legacies of State Socialism, which was recently published in the China Journal. Professor Walder, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jude. So first question I ask all guests is a biographical slash intellectual biography question. I think most listeners will have read some, if not most of your work, like myself. It would take most of the podcast to go over your entire career. So I, instead, I thought I'd ask you, in looking at the body of work you've done, are there a few consistent threads which run through your work, or are there a few main puzzles which animate your work? Or do you find yourself just moving from topic to topic as you see interesting? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I've always been interested in the trajectory of the Chinese Revolution. I first became interested in China during the Cultural Revolution. I took my first course on China in 1973. My dissertation was on the Mao era. My first book was about the way that the party organization shaped authority relationships in state-owned factories in China. The reform era immediately began, and so I became curious about the first stages of economic reform and enterprise reform. Then the opportunism came in because I was given the opportunity to do a national survey, a life history survey focused on inequality in China. And the main question there was, like it was in many other formerly state socialist economies, what would be the impact of a shift to market economy on social mobility and privilege and so forth? What would be the value of party membership and so forth in accumulating wealth and higher incomes. And then I had always been interested in the Cultural Revolution, which was what really was distinctive about China's version of socialism in the Mao era. And a lot of material was published and a lot of unpublished material became available. And I began to explore that. And I, I wrote far more on the Cultural Revolution than I'd ever intended. It wasn't a very happy subject to work on, but I always felt that I always wanted to get back to political economy because I was fascinated by the rise of China's large corporations and China's growth rates and so forth, but interested in the interaction of that economic growth with the political system. And one of the things that I realized was early on in the 90s, we thought that the shift to a market economy would more or less automatically weaken the grip of the Chinese Communist Party on society and the economy. It's turned out it's actually been quite the opposite. And the paper that you're going to interview me about today was basically inspired by a course that I started teaching at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford called The Political Economy of China, which the focus of that is how is this growth machine, which for a long time achieved 9 to 10% growth, how's China's political system, how does it interact with the economic institutions, and how is the Chinese economy structured differently from all other major economies. And when I finished my last book on the Cultural Revolution and started thinking about what do I want to do to cleanse my palate, I read a couple of pieces about how extreme inequality had become since the 90s. And I was a little bit surprised by that, not just inequality of income, but inequality of wealth. And I realized that this was very puzzling given what I was teaching my students in the Graduate School of Business, because I had emphasized the extraordinary capacity of the state to direct resources and the extraordinary control over, over resources. And yet I realized very little had been done to redistribute income. So that sort of takes me up to the present day. So there is a thread there, the constant evolution of the Chinese revolution and China's evolution after that, but also a bit of opportunism about what kind of evidence becomes available. Can I ask you a state of the field question? 
just thinking about your own career and others of that generation or just before who basically were able to get their PhD and then starting in the late 1970s, traveled to China. It was opening up. Archives were being opened, provincial archives. There was field research. I used to work at UC San Diego and think about the work that Susan Shirk was doing and Paul Pickowitz. What is the advice or guidance that PhD students starting today are getting from faculty like yourself and others about how are they going to study China's political system in an environment where a lot of the attributes that were available to yourself in the 70s and 80s aren't available? Is there a structural course correction going that is actually opening up a new positive arena of research using quantitative methods, or are we just losing something as the system tightens down over there? Well, there's so much more, even today, even even after the increased restrictions of the last four or five years, there's so much more information available about just about everything in China than there was in the late 70s and early 80s when I was just starting out. One of the things that's changed is that there's been a especially in political science, to some, certainly in economics, it's always been the case, to some extent in sociology. There's been a, a lot of pressure on students from disciplines to demonstrate causality statistically. And so what I see is a lot of students feel that they need to grab a data set and analyze it. And it doesn't matter whether the question they're asking is really that significant. So long as they can demonstrate statistically that there's some causal effect. And I've seen a lot of papers. I mean, these are very, very bright, well-trained students. And I asked them, okay, you're telling me that this coefficient affects this variable, but what are the people doing? (laughs) Who are the actors here and how are they making this happen? And so China's a lot more open than it was even today. My advice for methodology is be completely unprincipled. By that, what I mean is use every scrap of information to get to squeeze any kind of insight you can out of it. And that'll make your quantitative work much better, but it doesn't diminish you to have conversations with people and have a descriptive setup for what you're trying to do. I think if my friend and colleague, Rod McFarker, was still around, he would be happy that the arts of Pekingology or Kremlinology are even more important today than they were in the 1980s when we had a lot of information about differences among top leaders in China. So, Andrew, I want to now turn to the article in question, and you had, in answering a prior question, indicated what some of the motivation for this was, as you've been teaching this course on political economy, and as you looked at inequality in China, you thought, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, given what we know about the tools that the Communist Party has at its disposal. I wonder if we can actually just unpack that argument a little bit more and explain the puzzle in a little bit more detail. Because what I found striking about the article is it's not just the tools, but it's this is a nominally socialist country. So there's a double puzzle of state capacity, but also this is a country founded on principles of egalitarianism and equality. This is why a dozen or so men met in Shanghai more than 100 years ago in part to level inequalities, political wealth inequalities in in China. So unpack just for me how pronounced this puzzle is. And when you think about the tools at China's disposal, summarize for me why you think at a high level this remains as an issue of obvious state capacity is there, socialist lineage is there but inequality is there. How do you square that at an initial level? Right. Well, you know, it was inevitable back in the early 80s that China would become more unequal than it was in the Mao era. That's true for all of these transitional economies. But what struck me in looking at the data as of two or three years ago when I started thinking about this article was how extreme it had become and not just extreme distribution of income, but extreme inequalities of wealth holding. And I was also surprised that there's more redistribution in the United States and Russia than there is in China, which really took me aback. The puzzle is really twofold. The first is that China, one of the things I've been emphasizing in this course, and I've really been impressed with as I you know, examined the, the evidence, the Chinese state has much more control over national resources than almost any other major economy, far more than any other major economy. They own all the land. They control 90% of the bank assets, just about every measure. They still have about half of the, despite the evolution of the corporate system, despite the expansion of the private sector, something like half of the fixed assets in industry are still state-owned. 
that's extraordinary. And in terms of fiscal capacity, the state has a very healthy ability to extract revenue from the economy. Yet they redistribute income less than even the United States and Russia. And then even more puzzling, and this goes to the heart of your question, how is it that China became this way? Because the explanation for Russia and the United States has to do with, in very different political systems, how to property elites or politically connected elites structure the regulatory system and the taxation system in ways that favor them because China didn't, the Communist Party didn't collapse. They maintained state control over corporate resources, very little of this kind of looting of assets early on in the transition period. You didn't have a property elite that shaped the system that exists in China. So the explanation that you would go to for the United States or Russia about elite control state capture really doesn't fit China. And if you look at the other group of extremely unequal countries in the world, Latin America is famous for this, and that had highly unequal land tenure. That problem was taken care of in China in the 1950s with the land revolution. So it's not a land tenure issue. You don't have an indigenous population of landless peasantry in quasi-feudal, what sociologists describe as a quasi-feudal kind of land tenure relations. So it's puzzling in two different ways. They have the capacity to redistribute income and they don't do it. And secondly, the reason why they don't do it is not because of the power of oligarchies that you see in Russia, the United States, and many Latin American countries. Something that just occurred to me is why the existence of a, albeit constrained socialist narrative in China's political culture doesn't create a pressure on the government on behalf of citizens to create more of a welfare state. Why isn't there more pressure Again, albeit constrained, it's not a democracy. You don't exercise political voice in the same way you do a democracy. But a narrative of socialist egalitarianism, although muted, is still there and present in Chinese political culture, even within the party. Is there a reason that that doesn't exert more of some sort of upward pressure for the government to have even just a rudimentary welfare state? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It is a real puzzle. Part of it is controls on the expression of that. Students of Marxism who have taken that idea seriously have gotten into trouble by trying to organize workers. That's one dimension of it. But I think, and this goes to the work by my former PhD advisor, Martin White, who wrote a book called The Myth of the Social Volcano. And I think what comes out of that survey research for people's attitudes towards inequality is that China was growing so rapidly for so long that no matter how much inequality there was, people's lives were getting better, 10% growth. And there was quite a lot of trickle down during that period. But, you know, it started from a very low base, as you know. I mean, China's GDP per capita was less than India's at the beginning of the reform era. So I think that really shapes the way people look at their lives. Now, I've heard that more recent surveys carried out are showing that people are now much less likely to be optimistic about the future. And they're also much more critical of what it takes to become wealthy, where they used to always say 10, 15 years ago in these surveys, that people who did poorly economically, it was because they didn't work hard enough or didn't have education, didn't have the ability. And the idea that the system was rigged or dishonest people got wealthy and were able to rise to the top. That was always one of the last things that they would mention. That apparently is in recent surveys has flipped. And, you know, this is something that the leadership of China really emphasized. They set growth targets and they think growth targets are extremely important in terms of their legitimacy. And so if they're going to get much below 5%, I think they get very worried. And so I think, I think they understand this. And I think, frankly, I think their conception of how to make things more equal is based on a kind of trickle down economics ideology. I mean, I, I was quite struck. I won't tell you where this master's thesis was presented to me, but the students from China, and I was examining him on a, a thesis on poverty reduction in rural China. And the paper had about three or four pages of Xi Jinping's writings on the subject. And then the poverty reduction program in this poor area, and I think it was Guangxi somewhere, was that they were going to build an industrial park. So that kind of gives you the sense of their conception. It's a very developmentalist conception that, that economic growth will take care of all these issues. So long as everyone's getting better, inequality doesn't matter that much. And I've heard, I don't spend a lot of time parsing the comments of China's top leaders, but 
I've read in the newspapers that Xi Jinping has said somewhere that he doesn't want to create kind of a welfare mentality by redistributing income. I mean, you don't have to give people <laughs> money. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to transfer income without giving them money. So I, I just don't think they've really thought about it very much. And, you know, things have changed so fast and things have changed so far in China over the last 30 years. I think they just haven't had time <laughs> to think about all these different things. I don't know what it's going to take to get them off this line. But the other thing about the way the economy and political system is structured, and, you know, I didn't look at these topics for about 25 or 30 years. I was mired back in the 1960s in my research, is how little things have changed, actually, from the basic structure of state socialism. They still have, no matter what has changed with regard to the markets and private property, that basic structure of the economic and political system is still deeply embedded in the governance and the management of the economy. I guess that's a third irony because you wouldn't expect that to be associated with inequality. But if you look at the details, it produces extreme inequality. Yeah, and I was just thinking that that issue of how legacies of socialism might create bottom-up pressure. Actually, the way that they're dealing with that is efforts more recently to crack down on ostentatious displays of wealth. So you just basically try to blunt images of inequality as a way to deal with potential upward pressure from the public, which is seeing you know a slowing economy and then people driving around in Lamborghinis. And this is even within the Communist Party, you know, the Audi the Audi used to be the car of choice for every government bureaucrat, and they've now tried to move away from that. So there's an awareness of it, but obviously they're not looking to deal with it in a more structural effort to build a welfare state. Let me now, I want to ask you to dig into sort of the meat of the argument, which is twofold. One, I just want to ask for your answer to the puzzle, which is, given all that you have said, which is intriguing, what's your best guess as to why the party is fairly obdurate about addressing in a, in a real deep, substantive ways the growing inequality of, within China? Well, I guess I'd have to start with the thing that most people already emphasize, which is the maintenance of the hukou system. When the reforms began, there was this highly, highly egalitarian kind of land reform where they pulled apart the collective farms and they allocated plots, farming plots at a very equal basis to farming households, but they only got use rights. They did not have underlying ownership of the land, which I guess in the countryside, the collective owns, but that's basically still the state. And ultimately, the government, local governments asserted their ownership rights. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing that they did not do was to get rid of the household registration system, which prevented migration into the cities. And that was the legacy of the Stalinist model of economic development, where basically value was extracted out of farms by preventing farmers from moving to industry and forcing them to produce staple products at low state set prices that subsidize urban development. So they didn't make those two changes. They kept the hukou system. They liberalized it. So rural residents can become migratory workers without full citizenship rights in cities, and they don't get the benefits, the welfare benefits that urban residents get. That's emphasized by almost everybody as a very important driver of inequality. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that China was very slow to privatize state-owned enterprises. There are two things going on. The private sector, starting out with small-scale industry, rural industry, service sector began to expand outside of the planned economy. But it wasn't until about the early to mid-1990s that they began to restructure the state-owned enterprises. And outside of China, we blame shock therapy for having created a lot of inequality in Russia, but sociologists and economists that have looked at Russia have pointed out that shock therapy meant that ownership shares went to the people who worked in the factories, including the managers. With hyperinflation, the workers quickly sold their shares to the managers, but the deal was that they would maintain employment. So people weren't laid off, but you had a barter trade that emerged. Now, there was a vast increase in inequality, but it wasn't because workers were being laid off. It was that the factories couldn't afford to pay them. Okay, so it was a macroeconomic problem. In China, they didn't do that. They kept workers on the payroll as long as they could until the 90s, when the, the reforms that are connected with the name of Zhu Rongji, they began to restructure. 
state-owned enterprises, they laid off 40 million workers. And there was really not much for them to go to after that. And so a lot of them went into the service trade. A lot of them started driving taxis. A lot of them started working in massage parlors and those sorts of things. But the research that's been done on it has basically concluded that they fell back on family resources. The one thing that they did get was subsidized ownership of their work unit housing, which gave many of them a stake in what became a hyper fast real estate sector. But that was the only redeeming quality about the process. But it was a conservative conception, but it was eventually became quite radical. And I remember many of us back in the 80s said, oh, well, if they try to lay off all these state workers like they're going to have to do, they'll never dare do it. And if they do do it, <laughs> they'll be overthrown in a revolution. We were wrong about that. But it was really quite a draconian process. And it was much more effective in restructuring China's industry than the Russian attempt was. There are other elements that you discuss in the article, building on what you just said, but basically components of a legacy state socialist model that persisted today and act as sort of structural barriers to this. So other ones I want to ask you about, you just mentioned HUCO system, you mentioned SOE, quote unquote, privatization. Two others that I find interesting are the structure of China's tax system, which oftentimes is how governments will address inequities or at least try to create the foundation of a welfare state through income redistribution of using, for example, a progressive tax system. China doesn't do that. Can you describe at a high level why the tax system was, is, and will likely not be used as a key tool to blunt wealth concentration and income inequality? Yeah, I'll just give a kind of a big picture on that. All of the former state socialist systems, under state socialism, you didn't really have a taxation system. You certainly didn't have income tax. And, you know, in the old state planning system, firms didn't have ownership over their proceeds. And if they had any surpluses, they were part of the plan and they were transferred back into the financial fiscal system through the banks. So all of them had to create a tax system from scratch. And so there's two issues going on. One is what's the easiest way to extract revenue? And they started doing it on enterprises because there's many fewer of those. And that's where all of the income flows are being funneled through initially. All of them have been very slow to move away from enterprise-based taxation to household-based taxation. The reason you don't tax households and wealth initially is that there isn't much to tax. You don't want to you don't want to move to a system and then kill the income generation in the private sector. So if you compare the percentage of tax revenue on enterprises after 40 years of transition or 50 years in some cases, China is far more dependent to the present day on taxing enterprises. And they're taxing enterprises. There's two things here. One is they're dependent on taxing enterprises. They're not taxing household wealth in particular. But as a fiscal system, they're not very dependent on income tax either. I think what's going on here, the reason they haven't shifted, here's the curse of growing at 10% a year for so long. They didn't need to change anything because their revenue base was expanding so rapidly because the enterprise, state-owned enterprise, private enterprises were paying more and more taxes, you know, at this 10% growth rate. So they didn't have a problem and they didn't need to shift towards taxing the wealth that was accumulating in the private sector. So today they do tax salaries. And in fact, that's a highly progressive system of taxation on salaries. But it's the people who earn money from salaries are not the wealthy. And so there's very little taxation of wealth and very little taxation of income from property. If you own a business, your business pays taxes, but the profits and the income that you have really is almost not taxed at all. And I have not been able to find any evidence that there's an inheritance tax, for example. And there's a lot of wealth that's shifted overseas or is just not taxed. So if local governments in the United States and many other, many other countries will have a property tax that includes a tax on your home. Well, most of the urban residents who have purchased homes and who have experienced great improvements in their livelihood over the past 20, 30 years, something like 80 to 90% of household wealth for those people is in their homes. And if you start now, they've repeatedly talked about experiments into having property tax. But if you impose that, you would immediately alienate 
the people who have benefited the most from the last 30, 40 years. So I think there's a political constraint on that. If you start to tax other forms of property, and this would be the more wealthy people, you've got a couple of concerns there. One is that a lot of the family members of top officials have a lot of property. So you would have to register that wealth, report that wealth, which I gather is still not reported to the present day. It's not, it's not taxed. That would immediately put in jeopardy a lot of officials' situations, and they could get fed into the anti-corruption campaign. So I think there's a couple of constraints now on beginning to try to tax that wealth. Among other things, there'd be an economic, in addition to the political complications, there would be economic consequences of it because it would make the value of investment in housing even less than it is today. So it would really hurt the real estate sector, although it's hurting already a great deal. It would take away from household wealth, which would affect spending habits. Among the wealthy, it also might intensify capital flight. And I remember talking to a private entrepreneur a few years ago before COVID, and he was saying that if the Trump tariffs were maintained, a lot of private enterprise owners would face serious liquidity problems. And he said they'd probably start to try to ship their money overseas. And I said, well, how's that possible? There's a $50,000 limit on exchanging your money into foreign currency. And he said, oh, he said that limit's only for poor people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Chinese business and entrepreneurs are ingenious about finding ways to move capital out of the country. I wanted to raise one question on this last line of discussion, which is we've done a few podcasts here on China's tax system because I find it something of a puzzle for a few reasons. Number one is a key argument in your piece is one of the reasons that these state socialist institutions and and legacy policies persist is because they, from the party's own perspective, help keep it in power. And so they're loath to make any significant reforms in these areas because there's the sense that it's sort of zero sum in some ways with a grip on power. And yet I would think the party has a great incentive to ruffle some feathers, to restructure the tax system because they're leaving a lot of money on the table. So that's kind of puzzle number one for me. Puzzle number two is I take everything you just said about ruffling feathers, upsetting vested interests, But Xi Jinping strikes me as a leader who's pretty comfortable ruffling feathers and going after vested interests. Concerns about capital flight may be there, but Xi Jinping is driving right now a pretty significant change to China's political economy in reorienting it away from market reforms and towards industrial policy and trying to really wrench the steering wheel and steer it towards industrial upgrading I think he's sending all the signals. He doesn't care what the Jack Ma's of the world say. So if the argument was, well, they didn't want to upset entrepreneurs, he's doing that anyway. So the benefits of substantial tax reform seem to be significant. And finally, on the property tax issue, I would take the argument if it weren't clear that they continue to try property tax trial programs. So it's not like they've touched the flame and it's too hot. And last year, they just finished finally a national registry of property. So they're kind of contemplating it. So not looking for an answer, but more, I just find this one where even some of the common objections to why they haven't moved on tax reform, I think are probably true, but feel to me somewhat incomplete because Xi Jinping will, he's restructured the People's Liberation Army. You deal with vested interests when you do that. So more just sort of raising question that this still strikes me as a, maybe we're at a puzzle within a puzzle within a puzzle at this point. I don't know how many puzzles we have, but for a party that wants to stay in power, tax reform would be one of the issues where if I were advising Xi Jinping, I would be saying, this is our priority. If we want to be funding guns and butter, you know, if we want to continue to drive industrial upgrading, if we want to pay for innovation ecosystems, we need more resources. And the reason we don't have resources is not because they're not out there in the world's second largest economy. So we have an outdated tax structure that, as you say, was built a little bit, building the plane while it's flying, really structured towards, as you said well and, and right well in the argument, building now this out essentially around taxing commercial actors 
But even that we're not doing well. We have a substantially far too small tax bureaucracy relative to the size of the economy. So these just seem, even in the paradigm of party preservation, seem to be there should be a strong enough incentive to do it. Anyway, it's more of a rant there, but I just find this such a puzzle from a number of angles. Yeah, well, I mean, just the way you talked about it, there's a lot of different moving parts that are related to one another. Ultimately, the tax system, there are other dimensions of it other than overtaxing enterprises and undertaxing private wealth. There's also the distribution of tax revenues from the center to the localities. And, you know, that's something we haven't really touched on, but the post-1994 fiscal system ended up, instead of leaving so much of the new tax revenue in local governments, which was what happened in the 1980s and early 1990s, and that was before the big expansion of inequality in China. But when you leave a lot of tax revenue in localities, the priorities of local governments are not international relations, they're not diplomacy, they're not military, they're improving the livelihoods of local people. And after the tax reform, the bulk of the fiscal revenue, the tax revenue went to the central government and they would give it back in dribs and drabs to localities as they mandated different programs for expenditures. But if you change that system, it means that the center doesn't get to prioritize its top priorities, which are military buildup, which are internal security. These are not things that local officials are that worried about. The United States prioritizes military spending over social welfare, but for very different reasons, right? It's a differently structured political system. But I think their mentality is that they want the center to be able to drive the direction of the economy. They're they're pushing investment now towards manufacturing instead of land-based local development, but they want to maintain control over the process. I mean, I agree with you that Xi Jinping is a leader that has the audacity to break eggs to make omelets. I mean, he is willing to push against vested interests, but he's also very cautious and he does not want to alienate his supporters. He doesn't want to create disunity or discord within the party or within the leadership, even though he's done a little bit of that with the anti-corruption campaign. But I don't think, I don't think he's going after his own allies, but there's also, you know, he has this very strong priority placed on building up China's geopolitical strength and it's military and into space and all these other things, investing in high tech and high tech manufacturing, not TikTok. That's not the, I, mean, I, I sort of agree with him about that, <laughs> that subject. As, as someone who's never used any social media and only only reporting I ever hear about it makes I it guarantee something. you all parents in America agree well, with there you go. on but that not too. Just parents. I mean, I think it's sort of the, it's become the anal sphincter of world culture. I think that's his mentality. And yes, he is a very strong leader, actually, and he's willing to do a number of things. And I think five, six years ago, that's why many people were still hoping that that he would use his authority to make the kinds of structural changes in the economy, not just to reduce inequality, but also to make state-owned enterprises more efficient, to bring a greater play of market mechanisms into the economy, to try to improve total factor productivity, which has been declining for a long period of time. All those kinds of things require certain kinds of reforms that will step on the toes of vested interests. And he hasn't moved in that direction. And I think it was initially quite puzzling for, you know, there's many economists now that are really quite knowledgeable about the inner workings of the Chinese economy and can write about it in ways that sociologists can understand. And it was a puzzle. And you could kind of see over the last six or seven years, eight years, the disappointment gradually (laughs) sinking in among these observers that she's not going in that direction. He has the old religion, I think, of Soviet socialism 2.0, kind of, (laughs) I think is his conception. And I studied a lot more neo-Marxist political economy as an undergraduate that was healthy for a young mind. But I understand exactly his mentality because that's standard neo-Marxism, the basic critique of capitalist development, you know, the un, what's it, the un- disorderly expansion of capital, the wastefulness of marketing. And I know all that stuff. I mean, I read it. And so I understand the logic of his ideas, but he's not going to go in the direction that a lot of international economists and a lot of domestic economists reform economists believe he should go in. And I just had a meal yesterday with one of the former (laughs) influential pro-reform economists, and he's deeply depressed, as are many of his friends. I want to end here by reading several sentences from the paper 
less for your benefit because you wrote it and more for the audience because I think it sums up well the real crux of the why is this happening? And then I want to pose a final question to you. But on the very final page of the article, you write, what then are the drivers of China's extreme inequality? I've argued that its highly distinctive institutions are designed to preserve the ruling party's control over financial resources and the direction of economic activity, promote an investment-driven growth model, and ultimately prevent the formation of autonomous private actors with resources sufficient to weaken or undermine the party's control. And I think you argue that persuasively in the article, which gets me to my final question, which is, is there a politically realistic path under this leadership group to address issues of structural inequality. There's been things like the poverty alleviation program, but in a truly deep fundamental way, do you think extreme inequality is going to be a persistent feature of China so long as the party prioritizes self-preservation? Or can you imagine in any realistic world, one where it says, yes, we want to maintain control and power, but actually one way to do that is through the creation of a strong, sustainable welfare state to be able to ensure we blunt the most extreme examples of inequality in the country. I'm often impressed with some of my colleagues who can look at a situation which is not good in China and say, well, there's a, such obvious room for improvement and maybe there's reasons for optimism. And so what would be the reasons for optimism that they would shift towards restructuring their system. I think right now the ten geopolitical tensions around the world are such that I think it would be very difficult for Xi Jinping to engage in a fundamental restructuring of the kind we're talking about. The other possibility is that if things go very poorly, if China continues along the current line under Xi Jinping, he's, I think, perfectly able to switch and do something very different. I mean, the flip-flop on the zero COVID policy is, is an example, but it's also possible that he won't be in power forever. And so subsequent leaders may look at the past 10 years and say, this didn't work. We're going to have to start doing what the World Bank and all of these international economists have been telling to do for a long period of time is continue to open up, to move more towards market regulation, to have a growth model that's based more on consumer spending which means that you have to divert more income away from the state enterprise sector towards households and so forth. So maybe that's what it'll take. But I think we've been surprised over the last 40 years at the reason for optimism you always hear at the end of articles is that somehow over the last 40 years, China's leaders have always been able to figure out what the problem is and devise a workaround. So I guess hope springs eternal. My view right now is that the worse that relations get between the United States in China, the more that China creates what it's doing now, which is kind of an anti-Western access of power, the more intense that gets, the less the incentive will be to change anything, but just to tramp down on prioritizing security and security of the party. To me, the hope springs eternal, but then usually crashes into the rocks of Xi Jinping. And second, as I completely agree, I think there is a structural hamster wheel here or symbiotic relationship between the worse the geopolitical environment gets, the more it affirms to Xi Jinping that he's on the right path of needing to harden the system, batten down the hatches, ensure that China has a technological counter containment strategy based on indigenous innovation, self-reliance. The more partners like Russia, although potentially odious become actually important because you're in a hostile world. So I just, I fear that that is the sort of cycle that Xi Jinping in many ways has steered the country towards. But on that incredibly cheery note, Professor Alder, I want to thank you for, as an informal student of yours through articles and books for the 20 years that I've been thinking about and studying China, your work has always been the gold star of high quality, innovative, objective research. So I want to thank you for all that you've taught me indirectly through your work and also want to thank you for taking an hour of your time. I know you're in China and, and busy and teaching. So I want to thank you as well for being willing to sit down and discuss this really fantastic article. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. 
visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog.